tried patching things, but they couldn't patch it. And finally, at one point, the admiral on shore called and wanted to know if they should abandon ship. And Well, they didn't want to, but they did say that this ship was lifeless. Dead in the water. Who? Who is going to make it right? Where is that spark of creativity that comes at the moment of tohu wabohu? The thing is, it's happened to our faith, at least in our culture. The same process, the as above, so below, the same thing. I mean, you know, you come along, you have a structured faith when you're a kid, especially, and you know what it is you believe. You know, there's a God that does this, that, and the other thing. There's a God that, that comes into us and comforts us. But then something comes along and you, you get a question about that. You wonder, well, how come that God isn't, isn't in my life doing this thing? Why shouldn't that God be doing that? I mean, that God begins not to live up to your expectations. And the moment you've gotten that attack into your system, the, the peace leaves you. It's like, well, how do I trust? Where am I going to go to grasp hold of the, of the meaning and the power of a God? And eventually we find, especially in our mainline churches that are the structure of our faith itself starts to pull apart. It's like that dream that Tolstoy had where he was lying on a rope bed that represented faith to him, and one rope after another just fell away and fell away until it seemed like there was nothing left of his faith. It becomes lifeless and dead at a moment, at a moment when our nation and our community needs the spark of God's creative power. That's what's needed. That spark, that moment, when we can face the tohu wabohu, the mess that's all around us, and say, no, I will make something of this. You know what the soldiers on the, or sailors on the USS Cole did? They had a pump a portable pump that was not plugged into the ship's batteries or the ship's motors. And they figured that it could pump the water out. The trouble was it was not powerful enough to take the water from the lower decks of the ship, pull it all the way up to the upper decks of the ship, and have it go out over the side. It simply couldn't do that job. I love this. They drilled a hole in the side of the ship beneath the water line and stuck the tube, the output of that tube, into that hole and sealed it off as best they could. They turned it on, and they were able to pump the water out into the water. And it kept that ship alive. You know, it's in service today. Well, that's a spark. That's a spark at the moment of the tohu wabohu, ready to swallow us up. That's the creative power of God. And for John, that is exactly the power that he looks for in the lamb. There's the ram with its horns. They follow the Fibonacci sequence. Clever, maybe. Clever. And yet it's that which John looks for, for that pattern of God's creative power to unfold within each one of us so that the spark that we might see in Fibonacci numbers or any other thing that comes along our way can fill us up and we can apply it at those moments when we are afraid, when things have fallen apart. Behold the ram, slain, moving from death to life. It's time for us to be able to move from death to life. Our nation certainly needs it. Our community certainly needs it. And the good news is that this creative power that lives within us, each and every one of us, each one of us is creative. Right? That creative power, it's just natural. For my favorite line of the entire weekend, it's natural, but it's not automatic. There's work to do. Work to do if we are going to be filled with that 
power of creation that can spark the beautiful next out of that which is horrifying and old. Jana made an observation about the group, us at the All Church Retreat. And even though all of you weren't there, I think if you were there, she would still make the same comment. She's done this material many places. In fact, the first time she did the material she used yesterday was at Princeton Seminary about three years ago. And as she had a conversation with us, asked you various questions, she was overwhelmed with the depth of the answers, the ability to grasp hold of what was going on. She was impressed. Now, I know she tends to be enthusiastic, but I've known her for a long time, and I can usually dice out whether she's being polite or not. Now she saw something, she saw something in our congregation that she's known about that it's a congregation that does wrestle. So I use that as a context because I have something else that I notice, and I don't want it to be taken as a criticism. I really don't. But at one point, Jana asked the group how they would describe what she called their kerygma. So what a kerygma means is how do you describe the good news. How do you describe how God is working in your life? The question she asks all the preaching students because you've got to have some sense of how you're going to describe what it is that you're talking about. You need some sense of how you're going to describe the life of creative faith that you are living. Otherwise, you can't engage it. Here's what struck me. Everyone that answered, answered beautifully, but were quoting someone else. Now that means that some steps have been taken forward. There's been some searching. There's been, there's been an effort to try and grasp and grapple with what others have been saying. But I wonder if at a time when our community needs the creative power of God, if we don't need to take one step further if we don't need to get to the point where we can describe it in language that is each our own. That takes a lot of work. It's too easy to give up because I'll tell you, the, the intellectual problems involved are pretty large. And it requires one to have some experience to be able to, to work into that understanding so it can form who you are. You know, that's the only reason you even pay attention to theology. It gives you some framework in which to live and move and create and, and be with God. It takes that cognitive enterprise, that intelligible faith that we talk about, that's needed. But it takes a spiritual life too. Now I know there, I know there are a lot of people here that sort of when that comes, up, that, that spiritual life comes up, it gets kind of written off as, well, it's, that's not me. And, and I get that because, talk about the growing edge, this was my growing edge. But at the same time, what I'd have to say is that it's not optional. It, it's something that feeds into the cognitive, it's something that feeds into the way we serve other people as we practice the creativity of God. It's something that lives and breathes within a community and allows us to have the kind of life that can speak light at the moment of chaos. Now, there are lots of ways to engage in that kind of a spiritual enterprise. You don't have to say om and sit like that. There are lots of ways. But all of them require slowing down and noticing the presence of God in all the things that we do and in all of the things that we are. I wonder if that isn't the goal we set this year, to, to come to that moment when we can each say, yes, this I believe. This is how I live. This is the structure within which I create. The four horsemen are loose in the world. And the lamb, the ram of God, the creative spark that lives within us is also standing, waiting to act. It's very natural that that would take place, but it is not automatic. 
And I guess what I'd say in the face of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is, you and I have work 